I'm David Radke from the University of Waterloo. On behalf of my co-authors, Daniel Radke, Tim Brecht, and Alex Pavalchuk, I'm presenting our paper titled Passing and Pressure Metrics in Ice Hockey. The paper is linked in the description of this video, and it, it was actually published in the AI for Sports Analytics Workshop at ICHCHI 2021. I'll be talking about new metrics we designed for ice hockey aimed at helping AI models in a sport which has really lagged others in analytics due to challenges with data collection. Existing metrics of performance in ice hockey mostly revolve around offense. However, these events are pretty sparse. So-called advanced analytics also rely on this offense to derive value. Despite hundreds of passes per game, the only metric for passing is assists, which only records the two passes preceding a goal. This leaves AI models to only learn and benchmark with offense, failing to capture a whole other view of the game. Using new tracking data, we propose 12 metrics for an alternative view of performance around passing lanes, passing metrics, and pressure metrics. While our paper only discusses ice hockey, we believe our metrics could also expand to other sports like European football. Our sample data set consists of two games from the 2020 Stanley Cup Finals. Every player and puck carries a tracking chip. Players are sampled 12 times per second, and the puck is sampled 60 times per second. First, I'll explain our metrics for passing lanes. Our goal is to assign passes a degree of difficulty by calculating the available passing lane. This lane helps identify things like a player's risk level, their skill level, and if they actually get open for their teammates. Being open means being in a position to receive a pass. For instance, in the diagrams at the bottom, suppose we have a passer P and a receiver R, and we also have an opponent shown in red. As the opponent moves closer and closer to the direct pass, seen in the diagrams from moving left to right, R becomes less available until eventually they're not open at all. Now consider we have P and R again here. If R moves further away, this pass should be considered more difficult since the original distance D is shorter than the new distance D prime. So our first requirement is that a passing lane should scale with respect to the pass length. Now suppose we have opponents trying to actually intercept the, this pass and cause a turnover or a change in possession. If two opponents are equidistant from the direct pass, the time of the pass means that the second opponent actually has more opportunity to intercept it. So our second requirement is that the passing lane should be asymmetric with respect to the passing direction. One might then consider a triangle. Since the, since the first opponent would have to be closer to the actual pass to have the same threat level as the second opponent. However, this doesn't consider opponents behind P or R who also impact the ability for this pass to be made. So we add surrounding circles around P and R so that for a passing lane to have this size, there can't be opponents within these circles. Our third requirement is this consideration of the surrounding area around P and R. We use tangent arcs to connect the two circles and the entire shape is determined by a single parameter gamma. We take the union of the circles and the arcs as the passing lane shown here as the shaded region. The lane expands until the edge contacts the most threatening opponent, in this case, opponent two, and the corresponding gamma value of 0.31 is then the passing lane value. But if opponent four moves closer to R, the passing lane would then fit to opponent four, the new gamma value of this smaller passing lane is 0.15. Since this value is less than 0.31, this reflects the passing lane becoming smaller. Our fourth requirement is that our algorithm should always assign a real numbered value. To further visualize this algorithm of fitting to the most threatening opponent, consider this example where we have two opponents, opponent one and opponent two. When gamma is zero, the passing lane is just the direct line between P and R. When we grow the value of gamma, 
the actual shape of the passing lane also grows until we reach an opponent. In this case, we reach opponent one. And at this point, the corresponding value of gamma is the passing lane, which here is shown as 0.55. We take this shape and this gamma value to be the actual passing lane. And we derive two metrics which rely on passing lanes. The first is pass availability average, or PAA, which is the average value of gamma for a player's completed passes. The second is openness average, or OPA, which is the average value of gamma for each time step a player is R and their teammate has possession of the puck. Next, we present our passing metrics and the algorithms behind how we derive them. Our passing metrics are inspired by the number of outplayed opponents in European football and zero sum games. Most of our passing metrics rely on the notion of overtaking opponents with passes based on their relative positions. The way we figure this out is first consider this situation as before, relative to the direction of Black's attacking net, which moves from uh, left to right. If this pass is made, Opponent one transitions from being in a good defensive position where they were closer to their net than the puck possessor, which was P, to a poor defensive position because they're now further away from their net than the puck possessor, which would then be R at the completion of this pass. This means opponent one was overtaken by this pass. Now consider opponent two, who is behind P. When this pass is made, the defensive status of opponent two is unchanged because they were already in a poor defensive position before the pass, so they're not considered overtaken. The same goes for if opponent two were here. And so if this pass were made, opponent two is still in a good defensive position even though R receives the pass. So opponent two is not overtaken here either. Now we show how we score overtaking. Consider this scenario where P wants to make this pass to R. There's a total of five opponents on the ice, seen here. But there's only three possible opponents to overtake, opponent three, four, and five. If this pass were made successfully, only opponents three and four are actually overtaken, but opponent five is not. So in this case, the passer would receive some value of plus two over three, and each opponent would receive some penalty of minus one over three. And this entire algorithm together is zero sum. Here we list all of the metrics we compose using the tracking data. First, we have PASA, which is the successful passes made on average. Next, we have OVA, which is the average value of completed passes by a player when they overtake players. Next, we have OVT, which is the total value a player accumulates by overtaking opponents with their passes. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have BTT, which is the total penalty that a player accumulates from being beaten by their opponent's passes. The difference of these two creates PPM or passing plus minus, uh, which is similar to the plus minus statistic already in hockey, except that has to, or that deals with goals. We can then normalize PPM by the times that you overtake a player or are beaten by an opponent to create NPPM, the normalized passing plus minus. And finally, we have TOA, or the average turnovers made by a player per 60 minutes. Finally, we now discuss our pressure metrics. This is the zone of pressure, which is inspired by concepts in European football. We make various modifications for ice hockey to consider the smaller playing surface and compact player formations. The main idea here is that the pressure on P builds as an opponent moves closer to them. We derive three metrics using pressure. PRMA, the average pressure when a player moves the puck. PRSHA, the average pressure a player is under when they get a shot on goal, and PRSOA, the average pressure exerted on a shooting opponent 
when inside of that opponent's zone of pressure. That's an important concept as a defender in ice hockey. As a brief example of some results, we cross-reference the average passing lane for a player's completed passes along the y-axis with the average turnovers per 60 minutes along the x-axis. Notice Volkov, who has small passing lanes but also has zero turnovers. Perhaps this is an indication of Volkov having good passing performance. Now we show the average pressure when a player moves the puck along the y-axis. Again, Volkov also tends to release the puck under more pressure than most players, which could also explain why his passing lanes are so small, but he also still has zero turnovers. Compare this with Klingberg, who averages four turnovers per game without moving the puck under a whole lot of pressure. This may provide insight into Klingberg's decision-making skills. Now consider some spatial results. We show every possession for Joe Pavelski on the top and Andre Pilat on the bottom in our data set and shade the dots by how much pressure they experience so that darker shades represent more pressure. The black circles represent the player gaining possession of the puck. Notice how these two players have extremely different playing styles. Pavelski tends not to skate with the puck in the offensive zone and can actually withstand a lot of pressure. While Palat tends to move around the attacking net and builds the pressure upon himself before moving the puck. Next, I'm going to go through some in game scenarios. And first, we show pressure. Off the opening draw of game five, we show that Ryan McDonough is the first player to actually receive the puck. Ryan McDonough is 27 and blue here. And we represent pressure as a gray dotted line. And we show the value of that pressure above the player that is uh, pressing the puck possessor. So as we step through this shift, we see McDonough wants to take his open ice in front of him. Although he's pressed by Radulov, 47 in green. And we see this pressure value start to increase, which then forces McDonough to actually turn back towards his defensive zone and ultimately move the puck to his open defensive partner. Now, as we continue this shift, we're gonna switch from showing pressure to now showing passing lanes. And so as we complete this pass to Kevin Shattenkirk, we can actually calculate the passing lanes to all four of his teammates on the ice. And we wanna point out this one teammate, Blake Coleman, who has a, the most open passing lane of 0.55 the moment that Shattenkirk receives the pass. Now, it's a pretty common play for one defenseman to pass to the other defenseman and that player to pass it straight up the strong side wall to their winger, which would be equivalent here to passing up to Blake Coleman. However, it's also pretty common for a defenseman to take the open ice in front of them. And that's what Shattenkirk does. And we want you to notice the actual passing lane value above Coleman 20 in blue. And as Shattenkirk skates up the ice, the passing lane to Coleman decreases more and more, which then forces Shattenkirk to dump the puck in and give up possession. If we fast forward the shift even more, we end up in a situation where we can show some uh, players actually being overtaken with a pass. So here, the puck rimmed around the boards and number three on Dallas in green, John Klingberg picked up the puck. Now we see Klingberg skate over in, into the corner and is actually pressed by 19 and 37 in blue. Now Klingberg also passes to his defensive partner, 23 in green in front of the net. And when we see this pass, is caught and completed, we can actually display the pass from the origin to the destination seen in this green arrow. And we can also calculate the value from players being overtaken with this pass. For instance, Klingberg receives a plus 0.4 for beating two of five possible opponents. And each of those opponents, 37 and 19 in blue, receive a penalty of minus 0.2. In summary, 
our paper presents 12 stats in total. These stats are aimed at providing an alternative view of performance to improve future AI models in ice hockey. And while we present these 12 stats, we also want to point out that the possibilities for tracking data and analytics is pretty endless. So for instance, consider real-time information, uh, which is broadcasted using 5G networks. We can also use our metrics for in-game sports gambling and props bets, and actually increasing fan engagement in the game. And finally, while we propose these 12 stats, we also feel as though we could formalize better advanced analytics to then capture things away from offense, such as we do here. Thank you.